Well, first of all, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Layla Joyce. I'm one of the co-organizers of Explorations in Archaeology. We're really excited to have you join us for the 15th year of Explorations and our first all virtual year. Um, so before I introduce our speaker, I want to go through a few quick housekeeping things. So we're going to ask that you remain muted during the talk and post your questions in the chat. After the talk, I'll read the posted questions and if we have enough time, um, we can then move to an open question and answer session. Um, and then also, I just made this announcement, but I'll make it one more time. Uh, Dr. Bisa has made her slides available. You can access them, use, access them using the link in the chat. Um, so I am really excited to have Dr. April M. Bisa with us today. Dr. Bisa is a historical and contemporary archeologist of North America, an associate editor of the journal Historical Archeology, span and an associate professor of anthropology at Vassar College in New York. In 2011, she received the Gordon Wiley Prize from the Archaeology Division of the American Anthropological Association for her article, Memory, Identity, and NAGPRA in the Northeastern United States. This year, she's working on getting Vassar College in compliance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. April Bisa. Hello. No, no applause. I'll applaud for myself. That, there we go. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, and as she mentioned, I made the, the slides available so that you know don't feel like you have to uh, focus on the, the links that are there. But there are links. So for example, this art came from here. So therefore, you have all of my sources. And that'll help me go a little faster through. So I'm going to talk to you about um, the role of anthropology and archaeology in speaking about and speaking to contemporary Native American protests, not to the protesters or to the Native cultures that are doing the protests, but in bringing this gap together so that non-Native people understand what's going on and can connect Indigenous protests to the things that archaeologists usually talk about in the more distant past. So I want to start by acknowledging that Vasha College occupies the ancestral lands of those who are now part of the Stockbridge Munsee Band of Mohican Indians who were relocated from New York to Wisconsin and the Delaware Nation and the Delaware uh, Lenape tribe that were relocated um, to Oklahoma. I also want to acknowledge the ancestors from other lands that are in my short term care. Uh, as we work to return them to their communities and that those communities wish to remain anonymous at this time. So I will not be telling you which communities there are. But that idea of relationships in the territory acknowledgement and in the acknowledgement of our lack of compliance with NAGPRA, uh, I want to bring up the relationships that um, people like Vine Deloria have challenged anthropologists and archaeologists to think about and speak of. So many people are well-versed in Vine Deloria's 1969 Custer Died for Your Sins, an Indian manifesto that really challenged anthropology and social science in general as to what they were doing by studying Native people. Um, and if you haven't read the book, if you go to YouTube, Floyd Crow Westerman has a entire folk music soundtrack to the, the book, um, including a song about anthropologists. So I didn't put the link in here. But a lot of us are not as familiar with the 1997 volume, Indians and Anthropologists, Vine Deloria Jr. and the Critique of Anthropology. And why this volume is very important is that for years, anthropologists were trying to respond to what Vine was critiquing. And in this volume, it's an edited volume, everybody has their own chapter and they're saying, look, we're doing better. And then Vine himself authors the conclusion where he says, yeah, well, maybe you still have a lot of work to do. So these are Vine's words on page uh, 220 and 221 in the 1997 volume. And he says, if anthropologists and other social scientists begin to speak critically of, to the shortcomings of their own society, using the knowledge to which they claim to have derived from ob observation of the tribal peoples, then that will be a signal that something of real value is contained within the tribal context. So Vine Deloria Jr. was a Standing Rock Sioux uh, scholar. So Standing Rock will come up again. And this idea of relationships is something I want you to keep in mind, but also this need to think and speak critically. 
So I'm going to be speaking critically about archaeology, and I just have a slight obsession with warning signs. Um, so I'm going to hurl a couple of rocks here and, and feel free to avoid them. Um, but a possible statement that may or may not be true for you or the people around you is that archaeologists as a profession are often silent or absent from the concerns of indigenous peoples today. And when I see that this is not true is usually when their own research is at risk. So I'm throwing that rock out there. Let's just let it hurl and see what happens. But I have a couple of examples for you. Um, here is a, a news article from just last week where the Lumbee tribe opposes a Piedmont facility and a quote from a member of the Lumbee tribe, Wendy Moore Graham, is in this article that says, we will never know what was destroyed. We will never be able to access and verify the things that the ancestors left behind that prove that we have been here and that we are still here. So this is an example of a current event that I think archaeologists and anthropologists should know about and should help speak to, to those people who are not Lumbee people and wonder what the value of protecting sites might be. Here's an article from, so Lumbee are in Eastern uh, United States. Here's an article from the Mexico-United States border where judge denies the Kumie ban request to halt border wall construction. And here the quote that I pulled out is from one of the tribe's attorneys, Simon Gelter. And they're speaking to that as this border wall is constructed, the Kumie say that there are sacred sites and burials that are being dynamited, destroyed, bulldozed. So here they're saying, well, if there are remains there, the remains are going to be pulverized and the tribe has no way of bringing them back. And my last quick example here comes from Hawaii. So I'm trying to move across the continent here and, and show that these are all happening at the same time. Where are the archaeologists speaking about this? Here we have an article from Hawaii that the article is recent, but it gives the context that this started back in January workers had found human remains or iwi kapuna as they reshaped a multi-million dollar oceanfront lot in a luxury compound. So here the speaker, uh, Kalai, is saying all over the place, our kapuna, somehow it is okay to sacrifice them for the sake of buildings and cesspools and swimming pools, Kalai said, her voice trembling. It is not okay. It is not okay. I will say that until the last breath in my body can say it. So there are links in the, the slides to the original articles, so you could read all the content there. But I want to challenge archaeologists to not say that archaeological sites are being destroyed. These are sites of sovereignty. These are sites that are their sites for them to establish their own right to self-govern. And the right to self-govern includes the management of heritage and resources. It includes the right to protect ancestors. It includes the right to continue relationships with the landscape. And for some people like the Lumbee, it's a path to tribal recognition. So why aren't archaeologists speaking about this aspect of sites, of ancestors, of burials and graves, instead of saying we need to protect archaeology for the sake of archaeology? So I'm moving up to British Columbia to get out of uh, the United States, but to give you another example of how powerful sites and artifacts can be. Here, these people in British Columbia have been trying to get this gas pipeline stopped for a long time. They've won battles in court, but the gas pipeline is still coming. And then there was this article in February that two projectile points appeared and suddenly the entire gas pipeline was stopped. Now, since then, there's been debate about whether these were planted, whether they were actually there, but that is a detail that isn't really important to understanding that the power that archeology span and therefore archeologists have to be part of these struggles, be part of the discussion going here. So documenting sites and artifacts can impact the power of tribes and nations to protect their rights and their lands. It's not just about scholarship. So I'm going to bring us to Standing Rock. And remember, Vine Deloria was a Standing Rock Sioux. Here we have from September of 2016, an article that said, archaeological experts are appalled at the Dakota Access Pipeline sacred site destruction. 
And if you read further down, it says nearly 1,300 archaeologists and museum representatives had called for the federal government to do more to protect the tribe's sacred sites. So I ask you, I'm throwing one of those rocks, does being appalled have any real impact? The archaeology had no real impact in stopping the Standing Rock Dakota Access Pipeline, what was going on there. And the Standing Rock tribes still fighting the pipeline today. Like there are headlines today about Dakota Access, whereas most people have just moved on and thought that it was over. And if all 1,300 of those people who signed were archaeologists, it says archaeologists and museum representatives, and if they were all members of the Society for American Archaeology, then only 17% of archaeologists were even appalled, right? Which means that even fewer did anything about anything. I do want to acknowledge that the Society for American Archaeology sent a letter to the federal agencies that was dated August 13th, uh, 2016, and that's actually a link to the letter. But they, in that letter, focused on whether or not the Section 106 process was handled appropriately, and everybody had admitted it wasn't. There was a loophole they were using. Whether they had done sufficient consultation, consultation is a very low bar. You inform somebody of what you're doing, and you've consulted. That's it, right? And they expressed concerns over the burial cairns. So what else could archaeologists have done is something that I was very concerned about when this was going on. I'm in New York, I can't pick up and go all the way to North Dakota. And you know, I was teaching, but I was teaching archaeology of Native North America at the time. And I incorporated Standing Rock into my classes because to me, it was contemporary archaeology. It was how archaeology is very important today, instead of saying that's somebody else's job. So we have to acknowledge that at Standing Rock, archaeology was part of the conflict. There were sites that were being destroyed that people were trying to use to stop the pipeline. But I want to ask the question, should archaeologists have been part of the solution, both for critiquing the process and for educating the public and not saying, well, I'm not a CRM archaeologist in North Dakota or South Dakota, so it's not my problem. So I pulled some examples um, in the paper. There's more from Twitter. There was a no Dakota access pipeline hashtag, no dapple, but there was also a yes dapple hashtag. And this was a great way to see the ignorance of the world on display, right? How often do they ignorantly give themselves a hashtag? And here Autumn tweets, well, it doesn't make much sense, yes dapple. So this image is saying, well, why is the Standing Rock Sioux protesting when this pipeline has crossed water other places and nobody else protested? And it also tries to handingly point out that it's not on the reservation. But you could easily discount both of these arguments with one image and a little explanation. So the blue arrow is showing where the pipeline originally was supposed to go. It was supposed to go by Bismarck, which is 90% white. And Bismarck said, no, you're going to contaminate our water. So she's already wrong, right? But it's also that whether or not this pipeline is on the land of the Standing Rock Sioux depends if you understand treaties. And in the medium shade of gray, the stuff in between here, between the green arrow and the red arrow, there's a lot of that black line. There's a lot of that pipeline. That is all unceded treaty land. So I believe that archaeologists should have pushed that that should be considered a historic district. And I know the government has already said that treaty lands can't be considered historic districts, but why can't it? Why can't we push that? Right? Do we need to find piles of rocks to know that Indians were on their own land that is acknowledged in a treaty? And the 1868 treaty literally says, we know we're taking your land without your consent, but we promise no white person will ever do anything on this land without your consent, not consultation, right? So we could have said a lot more powerful things and say, make sure you consult, did you do section 106 and worry about burial carns. The other yes dapple that I pulled out for this presentation here, Tammy says, all oh, yes, another peaceful protester. She takes a picture or she shows a picture of somebody else took the picture of a protester holding a sign that says, kill the pilgrims, save the water. And she's saying that, well, this is evidence that they're violent. 
But if you know anything about indigenous history, you know that the kill the Indians, save the man slogan that both the United States and Canada used to do this assimilation, this forced assimilation through boarding schools and education. So if you're not familiar with this and you need to learn about it, there's a wonderful indigenous made movie. It's an indigenous horror movie starring all indigenous people and Bradley Cooper for some reason when he's very, very young. But if you notice where the red arrow is, the, the subtitle for the movie is Kill the Indian, Save the Man. So in both these cases, people who know can help take off some of the burden of the protesters from trying to educate people when they're trying to protest. Right? Why are so many anthropologists and archeologists silent? So I'm just saying we need to do more about connecting the past and the present. We need better education in general about the native present for anybody in order to create a more just future. But I think that archaeologists can be part of just addressing this gap. We could use our expertise and our cultural capital to teach non-natives about more than the distant past. Lots of non-natives want to hear about the native past from archaeologists. If we all keep talking about the indigenous present when we talk about the indigenous past, we'll make that connection. So here's my research part, right? So I think the best opportunity for us to have a big impact quickly is Alcatraz. Alcatraz Island off the coast of San Francisco is already a national park and it already gets 1.4 million visitors a year. That's a lot of people that we could educate quickly. Right? A lot of people who go to Alcatraz are going there because of the 1934 to 1963 federal penitentiary. They want to hear about Al Capone and convicts like that. But that's a very small window of Alcatraz's history. If you line up what Alcatraz has been, and I'll start at the bottom, right? This is reverse excavation. I'm supposed to start at the top. In 1873, Paiute, Apache, and Modoc people were imprisoned there when it was a fort. In 1884, a Chiricahua Apache chief was imprisoned there and died there in 1886. In 1895, this group in the picture of Hopi were imprisoned there. Then it was a federal penitentiary. And then after the penitentiary closed in 1964, members of the Sioux went and tried to occupy it. They only stayed a couple of days. They didn't have the resources they need. And from 1969 to 1971, it was occupied by the Indians of all tribes. And then continuing to, I assume it's not gonna to happen today because the island is closed right now, but happened last year, there's an annual indigenous un-Thanksgiving sunrise ceremony every year. So Alcatraz is more than anything else, a site of indigenous resistance. That if that was what the people, the 1.4 million people were gonna be taught when they were there, you know, we'll get a couple of them, but I think it would have a huge impact. So if you don't know about the 1969 to 71 occupation, here is the invitation that was sent out. Uh, the group called themselves the Indians of all tribes. And this native protest brought national attention to indigenous issues and the red power movement in 1969, not unlike how Standing Rock did in 2016. So I think a little bit of archeological sensibilities, a little bit of archeological intervention at Alcatraz can help to restore that original impact. So if you go there now, when it's open, not during a global pandemic, don't like bring your own boat out there and say, April said, go over there. There is one room in the museum complex that you could learn about the occupation. And it was created by veterans and descendants of the occupation, lots of indigenous activists, artists, scholars, students, faculty from Native Studies programs. It is fabulous if you already know what happened there. Right? If you do not know what happened there, it seems completely disconnected. So what I did, being a creepy anthropologist, is I sat in that room for two hours and I observed what happened. Nobody else spent more than just a couple of minutes in that room. There is this wonderful, it's a little old, old TV screen. It's not even an LED, it's a little old TV screen. But what's great about it is you have to sit on a bench to look at the TV 
And it forces you to look into this mural where you're looking directly into the eyes of the occupiers who are all assembled in the same cell block that you've just walked through and you're on their level. But it also says there are four different videos in this presentation, which I think is a little intimidating to somebody who's not sure why they're there in the first place. And if you don't catch it at the beginning, you have to know where I am in this story. If you go to leave the room, you have to look up at the door as you're leaving and it says Alcatraz is not an island, it's an idea. But it doesn't actually say what that idea is, right? So I think that this room is great for people in the know, but people who aren't in the know, it's part of a missed opportunity. So I'm going to give you the words of the Indians of all tribes from the island from November 1969 as a way of bringing to you what they would have to say. So they said, we had been in this land for thousands of years. After a hundred years as prisoners of this country, we feel that it is time we were free. We have gone to Alcatraz Island to preserve our dignity and beauty and to assert our position. The people of this country know a little of the real story and tragedy of the Indian people today. We intend to tell them that story. This is only the first stepping stone of a great ladder of Indian progress. We appeal to your sense of fair play and your desire to do what is right by all people. Indian people appeal to you to stand up and help us in our time of need. So I think this position that they were advocating for is permission to speak of their occupation to the non-native, to make sure that they learn something. So one of the reasons I went to Alcatraz is in the early 2000s, they first started to include the occupation in their interpretation. And I wanted to see how well they were doing. So the next couple of slides are a, a, a contemporary archeology span take on how they're doing and how they were doing when I went there in 2015. So contemporary archaeology, if you're not familiar with it, we almost never dig. We just use archaeological sensibilities, the layering of time, the looking at sites, the looking at cultures over long stretches of time to critique what is going on today and what is going on around us. So when you get off of the ferry at Alcatraz, you get to, if you see the National Park Service symbol there, they tell you to assemble under this United States penitentiary sign. And there a park ranger will tell you what there is to do and see. So everybody gets there, everybody stands there. And that sign, if you look at the other side, has some of the occupiers. This is what the sign looked like in 1970. And they had written on the sign that says, welcome United Indian property and then a little further down, allowed ashore without a pass Indian land. And you could see that only part of it has been replaced. So here's a closer up look. So when people get off of this ferry boat to go to see a penitentiary, and the first thing they see is Indians welcome United States penitentiary, it's the wrong message, right? So the archeological sensibility about these layers is very important to see that, yeah, it's great that they help to restore part of the sign. And they, the people who do the repainting are uh, veterans and descendants of occupiers. So they're great in how they do that. But this, I think, created the misunderstanding that tainted people's experiences throughout the entire site. So after you leave that spot, you walk towards this water tower. And on the water tower, and you can interpret various ways of how to read this message, right? Is it peace and freedom, welcome home of free Indian land? Or is it peace and freedom, home of the free, welcome Indian land, right? But when I was there, people were saying, why didn't the Park Service paint over that? Because they thought it was graffiti from a prison riot. So therefore, that wasn't what they wanted to see, and it was ugly and needed to be covered. So since 2015, the park has installed an interpretive sign at the base of this water tower. Whether or not people will know enough to read it and not have that uh, misconception. When you leave the, the cell block that most people are there to see, you come out this door. So you have to turn around and look up and you can see that it's in the shadows most of the time. 
But here under the eagle in the American shield, somebody has painted in the words free. But there was no interpretation before. I believe they're installing an interpretive sign there now. But again, using archaeology, that's not what it actually looked like during most of the protest. The picture, the black and white picture on the right is what it looked like for most of the protest. Towards the end of the protest, it looked like this. So they had added a piece of cardboard that said, this land is my land. And they had attached a picture of Guacale or Geronimo, an Apache resistance leader who had died 60 years earlier. So isn't that stratigraphy? Right? We are hearkening back as the occupiers in 1969 to somebody who died in 1909. And now we can be talking about that in 2020. Instead of it just being something that you may or may not notice, we could tell a very layered story here on this piece. So there's also a lot of removed messages, and this one probably will never come back because of the, the politics of it. But this is from a National Park Service report um, where when the Park Service started giving tours in 1973, they actually took away some of the signage. So the um, occupiers had selected cells and written the names of politicians above the cells to symbolically imprison them. But the visitors, the Americans who came there, did not like seeing names like Agnew over the cell block. So it says, when the Park Service began giving tours of the cell house in late 1973, so many visitors complained about the graffiti that the Park Service staff painted over it. However, the graffiti was still visible through the new paint. There's layers here, right? It refused to be covered up. So the rangers swapped the metal covers with clean covers from the third tier, and the covers with graffiti remain on the third tier. So things should be back in place one way or another, but they have documented the names of the politicians at least. Off of the island at uh, Golden Gate National Recreation Area that's in San Francisco, they have artifacts from the occupation that I think that if those artifacts were on the island, people would be able to confront their misconceptions a lot easier. So if you were an indigenous person, you wanted to join the occupation, you had to go to Pier 40 and this guy named Joe Morris would give you a pass. So on this pass, I put in the green boxes there. Somebody named Terry listed her tribe as American Indian by birth and her purpose for going to the island to learn Indian culture, right? So it's clearly not a prison revolt it's clearly not an aggressive thing. And it's clearly something for indigenous people, not necessarily for non-natives. And then what's more American than a little league baseball written on it, me, the power of peaceful freedom, right? This brings us to the other part that a great way to get Americans attention is to talk about dogs, cats, and children, and children, right? Just like at Standing Rock in 2016, people brought their children to Alcatraz for the 1969 occupation. There were so many children that they started a school. They had school at Standing Rock as well. There were 12 students on the Big Rock School, grades one through six. They taught the standard things, but also native history and culture and native craft work. And one of the occupiers who was a Mohawk, Peter Blue Cloud, he said that the children were what the occupation was all about. It was for their future that we dared defy the government. And this image is a picture of Richard Oakes, who was also a Mohawk, who was the spokesperson of the occupation, and his daughter, Yvonne. Unfortunately, Yvonne fell to her death on the island. And after she died, Richard lost his feelings for the, the occupation, and he left the island, which I think really reinforces that it was about the next generation. Unfortunately, Richard was murdered not long after um, he left the island. So contemporary archaeology critiques the layers of what remains at Alcatraz and what has been restored. And we could use it to contextualize what is there and what is missing. We could connect the occupation to larger trends of indigenous resistance and pan-indigenous activism. So pan-indigenous just means people from lots of different tribes coming together. So going back to what were Richard Oakes's words on that 
uh, room, Alcatraz is not an island, it is an idea. So we could do Alcatraz archeology span by pointing to, we don't have to excavate, all of the related sites. We could find on the island, where were these indigenous people imprisoned? And why isn't there an interpretive sign there for the imprisonments of the Hopi and the Apache and so forth? We can talk about the reservations in the cities of the occupiers who were moved by the Relocation Act. There were so many Mohawk in San Francisco because the government was promising people that if they moved to urban areas as indigenous people, the government would get them jobs and they would do better. Right? So we could connect Mohawk land in New York to Alcatraz. We could find the site of and put an interpretive marker at the Burn San Francisco Indian Center. So the reason that the Indians of all tribes went there in 1969 is the Indian Center burned down. And then they had no place to gather. And at the same time, San Francisco was saying to its communities, Alcatraz is no longer penitentiary. What should we do with it? And the Indians of all tribes said, we know exactly what to do with it. And they went and turned it into something. Right? That was their offense. It was an abandoned place. And they turned it into something that had a radio station, that had newsletters, that had schools. Right? We can look at the Pier 40 supply area where Joe Morris would hand out those little pink uh, passes. But we can also look at and point to all of the sites of protest that were inspired by the 1969 occupation, including the Wounded Knee occupation of 1973 and the multiple camps at Standing Rock in 2016. But it doesn't end there. So my co-author on the journal article here, Glynis Olin, was an undergraduate research assistant for me. And she went through all of the books about indigenous activism. She went through all the websites, all the newspaper articles, and anything that said we drew our inspiration from Alcatraz, she put on this GIS map. And this is a completely open, crowdsourceable map. So if you click on that link, you could look at all of these protest sites. You could add your own, right? It's that simple. We're not trying to claim ownership of any of this. But she overlaid protest sites with reservations with pipelines with mines and you can see how infrastructure is one of the reasons that indigenous people have been protesting where there's no infrastructure and no reservations there is no protest right so there's these correlations but if you're familiar with the national register of historic places criterion one of the criterions is is this site part of a broad pattern of american history and also to be National Register eligible, you have to be at least 50 years old. So 1969 occupation, more than 50 years ago, all of these sites connected to it, right? They said the treaty land can't be National Register District. I say using Alcatraz, all of these sites can be historic sites. And therefore we could put them on lists, just like we do with George Washington's house, Thomas Jefferson's house, and we could include them in the dominant narrative without necessarily excavating, without doing anything that the indigenous people who are closely associated don't want us to do. So in summary, I think by remaining silent on recent Native America, archeologists actually help to perpetuate the myths of the vanished Indian. We allow stereotypes to go unchallenged like those yes dapple posts, and we miss chances to link past and present and time immemorial. And if we start including more of recent Native America in what archaeologists do, we could reinforce the continuity of peoples and identities. We could educate non-natives on Indian country, and we could seek to contextualize movements without co-opting or confronting them. That's what I have to say. April, thank you so much. That was phenomenal. All right. That was phenomenal. That's what we've had all year. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, so we don't have any questions in the in the chat. If people have questions that they would like to ask Dr. Besaw, you're welcome to unmute yourself um, and and ask questions. We've probably got about 20 minutes or so. Well, at least this part's like is just like regular explorations. <laughs> oh, hold on. Let me move my thing. Oh, 
Okay. Oh no, you're fine. Hi, April. Um, I was wondering if you could, so there's clearly a process that things go through in order to become a national park. I was wondering if the Alcatraz protests were part of that argument to make Alcatraz a national park or, or what that sort of background process was in that regard. Yeah, it wasn't originally. Um, if you look at the screen that I had captured as to why you would go there, if you just go to Alcatraz at the National Park Service website, it says that it's the site of the, one of the oldest lighthouses. It is, it has gardens and estuaries, right? It's part of the larger picture, but it's mm -hmm. not something that they had ever really done until the 2000s. And I think as the uh, sunrise ceremonies became more and more popular, I think they were pushed. I think they were pushed by the uh, veterans and the descendants. Um, some of Richard Oak's relatives are involved, um, but now they have uh, people who come out as interpreters who are um, former occupiers, veterans of the occupation, will go there and just spend the whole day ready to answer questions. But a lot of people don't have questions because they don't know enough yet um, to have questions. So it wasn't part of the original big piece, but it has become, and it was never ignored completely, but it has become more and more important. And I've been invited to go back out several times making it fit within my schedule and now the pandemic is a problem that they're very proud that they've fixed a lot of the things that i pointed out so that original sign when you get off the ferry is now they tell me restored to the original right so if pandemic allows i'm going there in april of 2021 and I'm gonna do more work and do some work with the interpreters there and uh, look at some more artifacts and talk to some of the people who come out there to, to answer questions. Very cool, very cool. Um, in terms, so in that room, I'll just go ahead and ask. Um, so in that, in that particular room, was, was that interpretation set up specifically by in, like national park interpreters with consultation from descendants, however, or the descendants themselves set all of it up? My understanding that it was completely, it's a consortium of groups. Um, and the occupation was part of the, the creation of Native Studies as an academic discipline. So there are uh, colleges and universities in California that are very tied to Alcatraz for that reason. It, it was, they, they provided the space and they allow the, this consortium of people and groups to do what they want to do there. There's a little sacred area in the corner um, that says, please don't disturb this little sacred area and stuff. It very much reads as, you know, authentically, this is what people who care about it as a site of indigenous resistance want there. So the, the problem is there's no little in between for people who either know a lot or yeah. don't know anything. Neat, 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 neat. Um, okay, so we have a question in the chat. So how would you recommend CRM professionals best incorporate your suggestions on the final slide into their reporting to their clients and to regulatory bodies? So for all of you guys who have written a CRM archeology span report before, you know you have that boilerplate, which is like, and the first human beings and the soil is a sandy loam. Put the treaty history in there. Has anyone ever said you are not allowed to have the treaty history in there? Put the removal history in there. Put what tribes now claim that land as ancestral land. And I'm not saying like, if you're gonna lose the contract and your livelihood, fine. But for the most part, our clients don't read our boilerplate, right? If you are in the SHPO office, push for, I don't care what the earliest geological landform was. If this is a more recent site, I care. So the environmental impact statements for Standing Rock never mention a treaty. It doesn't even talk about the reservation because it says it is off reservation, period, end. So it's just whether or not ancient sites were found. Right? That's why I published this in the journal Historical Archaeology, because I think historical archaeologists need to get more involved in the CRM search for ancient sites and be part of that connecting. 
that if you're gonna put a boilerplate, that boilerplate should say, what happened after reservations? Why do you stop in your CRM boilerplate at some arbitrary year, right? Make that all the way through to today. And then I think we'll see change. And it's not a big, huge thing. Write it once for your area, copy, paste. And until somebody harasses you about it, try it. Let's see. That's fantastic. I, uh, so I mean, not CRM reports, but there's definitely going to be a section added to my dissertation. <laughs> yeah, that's really neat. It's not something we've been taught to do, but it's not something that we're prevented from doing. Yeah, I think a lot of times we just don't, we don't think about it because we're not taught to do it. And because we work with people who also just don't think to do it, you know, even if they would happily do it, it just doesn't occur to most of us, I think. Um, but I mean, well, we can change that by just doing it. <laughs> if everybody is doing it, it's not like your client is going to go find somebody else, right? right? And if the state is expecting it, your client's not going to go find somebody else. And it will help move this idea of consultation as just informing somebody who doesn't live anywhere near here. And so when I started pushing for our repatriation stuff, everybody around me who doesn't do anthropology was like, well, there's no Indians around here, right? Like, so that's where I know territory acknowledgements can be very performative, but it does make that connection. And it does point out when people are undereducated. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that particular aspect for um, for for land acknowledgement statements and that kind of thing. I hadn't thought about that particular connection. It's really interesting. Um, so we have another question. So considering this island was used as a prison for Native Americans during the Indian Wars, is there any talk or push to put up historical markers identifying it as a site of the USA's genocide, cultural genocide campaigns? Not that I know of. And I, I did this critique and I talked to them on the phone um, when I was writing it up and, and got feedback from them, but I haven't gone back and actually worked with them. I would love when we're back with having grants through the Park Service, right? I work for the Park Service here in New York um, doing research for them, but I haven't done out there. And when we're sure that I can fly to California and come back and not have to be quarantined for two weeks, I think there's lots of opportunity and it doesn't have to be me. It could be other people. I'm in no way claiming that this is mine, but I see an opportunity for work to be done. And therefore, if nobody else is going to do it, I, I would like to push for, for some things, but I haven't seen the maps yet to know exactly where the fort was to know if it's easily incorporated. At some point you have too many interpretive signs and nobody reads anything. But I like doing like walking tours where you could have different versions of tours. And if you go back to Alcatraz, like your family comes to visit and then a different family comes to visit, you could go do a different tour. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a static sign. It could be a website that people who go to the island could just pop up your website and do a different tour. So now we're doing like anarchist museum work. I love it. Oh, so the next question is, how did you originally get involved with this sort of research? Well, I've been doing my primary research project for the last uh, nine years has been uh, the community's um, sacrifice for the New York City water system. And Standing Rock was water, right, is what they were fighting for. And the lake that is their central lake there, that is the water system that they were trying to protect was actually created by the Army Corps when they created these dams. So through thinking about urban water system infrastructure, which who knew that an archaeologist would be doing that, I started seeing all these connections and those connections made me feel like I had something to say as an archaeologist. So the book that I'm writing on urban water systems is going to reference the Winnipeg water system that has taken land from the Shoal Lake people, the Dakota Access water system, the Kinzawa Dam in New York. And when I was watching the Standing Rock protests, a Seneca from New York 
was on TV saying he went to Standing Rock as part of protesting the Kinzawa Dam that was created 50 years ago that submerged most of the Seneca Reservation. Right? There's all of these webs of connection. And if I could find it doing urban water systems in New York, I'm sure many archaeologists can find connections to many of these sites. And it seemed irresponsible to not talk about it. Nobody gave me permission, though. I just did it. All right, so we have one other question. It's a little bit of a long one, so bear with me. This is during the Standing Rock po protest, there was media coverage describing protesters as jihadists. Um, could you speak to whether that might have been intentional language used uh, or simply a descriptor designed to be discrediting and inflammatory to Americans, American media consumers? A lot of media coverage is always, everything's a war zone, right? When we have a hurricane, it's a war zone. That's what people tune into. So anything that is about how Standing Rock happened and was perceived, I will point you to some great books like Nick Estes, uh, Our History is the Future, which you know, goes into great detail. There are lots of indigenous people who were there and whose land it was and whose tribes it was. So I would rather those people speak to that question, but I would challenge us as people who consume the media that we click on it if it's something like that. And we don't click on it if peaceful indigenous woman protests something happening in her backyard. Right? So I think it's the media is giving Americans and the world what they're craving, which is the sensationalism that divides, instead of thinking about how all of these struggles don't need to be these big, huge, violent things. This protest was going on for a long time before the media ever cared. But how long was it before we cared? Right? We started caring when it got violent. So that's why the rest of the media said, oh, this is a good story because there's violence. So I would challenge us to start paying more attention to the peaceful protests and stop clicking on the things that are intentionally inflammatory. I mean, that, I feel like that's probably good advice in general, let alone for, for these specific things. Um, so that's really interesting. That's a really interesting question in the context of the misuse under or misunderstanding of the concept of jihad by by American media. Absolutely, it's certainly a, a co-opted term, um, if if nothing else. They they didn't know what to do with it because they didn't understand it. It seemed like there was nothing like it ever before, even though the same people in the same area were protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. Right, so it, it is a failure of the media to be able to give us all of the stories so that we see the connection. So that's where I think that archaeologists could be making the connection. If we can't rely on the media to do it for us in a respectful way, maybe, like Vine Deloria said, maybe there's some value in what we're doing. So let's go find that value in what we're doing and see a problem and try to solve it instead of just being critical of other people. I think that's a really, um, and it kind of comes back to something that we were talking about before we, that you and I were talking about, um, before we got started, this idea that we should um, be going back and sort of re-excavating old, like previously excavated collections instead of trying to find new sites and trying to find brand new information um, in brand new places, but looking at older places um, for potentially new information. Um, but this idea that we should be that part of our job is to draw connections for other people because of the sort of mainstream groups of people, we are the ones who have the ability to draw those connections and the knowledge um, to be able to draw between. Um, that's, I don't think I've ever thought of archeology span or archeologists as doing that or as that being sort of part of the job. Um, but it, I mean, it's the thing where extremely well suited for and certainly the greatest impact we could have in, in modern in modern life and in people's everyday lives um, as opposed to just figuring out who was where and when and what their stuff was 
Mm -hmm. um, which not that I don't love that, obviously, <laughs> but, but it's not but, a lot more yeah. work to make that web. Yeah. Yeah. This is fascinating. You've got my brain like firing like crazy. This is wonderful. <laughs> well, it's not as late there as it is here. So you don't have to worry about, well, it's time to go to sleep or anything. <laughs> That's true. And I don't have to be in the lab at seven tomorrow. So <laughs> write your own manifesto tonight. It might happen. <laughs> Send me a copy. I, I right. have a quick yeah. question. Um, so this is uh, just about the contemporary archaeology part, and forgive the blanket, it's below 50 where I am, and I'm cold. Um, so when you're talking about contemporary archaeology and stratigraphy, um, I think the thing that jumped out to me was that a lot of the interpretation of the stratigraphy was either um, photos or like anecdotal conversations. Um, I guess I'm just curious about how you gather the information and if you think there were points where like there's probably something you're missing as we always know there's always one area. Um, if there's anything like that that you would dig into more if you could find the resources. Yeah, and the, the slides at the end have a link to the journal article that I just published on this. So it has more stuff in there. But for the most part, I just immersed myself. I have probably 20 books, mostly written by indigenous people about indigenous resistance, protests, and Alcatraz. And I just looked for the patterns, right? Like we do if you dump out a bag, I'm, I'm a faunal analyst. If you dump out a bag of bones, you don't say, oh, there's too many bones here, I'm overwhelmed, right? You might say that at first, but then you start making subpiles and subpiles and subpiles. I, I was just teaching my class last week about taxonomy and how taxonomy helps us make generalizations, right? So I just started looking, where is the stuff that I think will draw that line from Standing Rock down to the past, down to the older and older sites that go past that? And you know, there's lots of other stuff that if you got involved, you might see something different. And that's why it's great that as many people work on these sorts of things, you know, don't be, this is my project, that's your project, step on toes. But I just immerse myself in this and, and look for those patterns. So I've been studying this New York City water system, which started in 1847. And the main area of demolition was 1906 to 1915. And a lot of the stuff that was submerged, I've been studying through looking at postcards that people are sending in 1906, 1907, 1908. And I have to date those postcards often by the style of the card, the, the, the stamp and so forth. But because they're dated pictures of how things changed over time on a landscape I have no access to, right? I start seeing this layering in the stratigraphy. So, some of it is that I've been doing contemporary archaeology for years, so it was easy for me to see the patterns there. If you've never jumped into the contemporary archaeology stuff at all, there's a thing called CHAT, the Contemporary and Historical Archaeology and Theory Conference, that is usually in England. Amazing group of people. If you go there for one weekend, it will change how you think as an archaeologist. But there's also a book, I have all my books here, um, after Modernity by Rodney Harrison and John Schofield. And John Schofield has done uh, protest archeology span before. This is like one of the manuals of, of how to do contemporary archeology span where like they talk about um, this guy Adrian's project where he found a van in the woods and he dismantled the van and labeled each component by what country it was manufactured in and therefore had a site of globalization. Right, so the more you get into contemporary archaeology, the more you see the creativity that you could do using your archaeological sensibilities to talk about today. But everybody from a different background will say something different about the same site in contemporary archaeology. That's fascinating. Um, for those who are still with us, I'll go through. I'll go through the recording um, later this week. Uh, or over the weekend um, and make up a little list of, of books and that sort of thing um, that I will make available on the explorations page. Um, so look for that probably, 
probably sometime next week. Um, probably sometime next week by the time I get to it. Uh, but we'll make sure there is a little like book list um, and some other stuff that, that comes out of this so you can refer back to it. Um, so we're coming really close to time. Um, so I just first and foremost want to thank you so much for being with us, April, and for talking with us today. This is phenomenal. Thank you so much. <laughs> My like Zoom applause. <laughs> <laughs> And, and thank you to everyone um, for joining us today. We hope that we will see you on September 23rd, which is our next talk. That will be Experiments with Atlatls as Combat Weapons by University of Kansas PhD student Justin Garnett. You can register for that talk on the main Explorations in Archaeology webpage like you did for this one. Um, and we hope that we'll, we will see you on the 23rd and for our subsequent talks. Thank you all so much for coming. Enjoy your evenings.